tonight in Psalm 116, the um, title of this psalm is Thanksgiving for Deliverance from Death. And um, instead of reading it through, I would love to read it through, but um, I'm just going to show you just a couple of verses in it. This is the nation of Israel. Isn't it wonderful that no matter what the machinations of man is, God has a plan. He's, he's already installed his son on Zion's holy hill. And all the things that God has said in his word are going to come to pass. Now it says we're going to live in the days of the scoffers and they'll say, where is his coming? And we're living in those days, but we believe by God's word that he's showing us. Um, we're seeing it now through our television screen. Uh, screens, social media, what is happening. Now, if we start at Psalm 116, verse 1, isn't this lovely? Think of it being Israel speaking. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. And the next verse is the Jewish people in the tribulation. The cords of death encompass me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. This is the remnant, the godly remnant of the Jewish people before they call out upon him. And look at that as a description of the tribulation. The cords of death encompass me. The terrors of Sheol came upon me. I, Israel, found distress and sorrow. And look at verse 4. Then... Then, at the end of the tribulation, what did they do? I called upon the name of the Lord. And what do they say together? Should we say it together? Oh, Lord, I beseech thee, save my life. Hallelujah. And this is how Israel, you can see it in the order if you're showing somebody. That is a time of tribulation. They're calling out in distress for him. Now, if we go down, verse 5, it's too good to stop. Great, look what they're saying now. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. Hallelujah. This is Israel. I was brought low and he saved me. And look at this verse. I used to write this verse out every morning in my day book at work because I loved it. But I never realized it's the Jewish remnant after the tribulation. Return to your rest, O oh my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. And I used to say, Julie, why are you panicking? Return unto your rest, O oh my soul, because the Lord will deal bountifully with us as Christians, but ultimately as the nation of the Jewish people. But when you look at it as the Jews, it looks even better, doesn't it? So shall we go to verse 8? For thou hast rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. They were in a mess. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Hallelujah. I believed when I said I am greatly afflicted. This is the Jewish nation. What are they going to say? Verse 11. I said in my alarm, they're in the tribulation. All men are liars. They've deceived them. The false peace has gone out. The lie has been done. Verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me, says Israel? Look, what, he says I'm going to take the cup of salvation. Uh, Israel as a nation is going to, I've already got the cup of salvation. We've all got the cup of salvation. And you can raise it to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm saved. I'm saved. Hallelujah. But this is what Israel are going to do. I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may it be in the presence of all his people. And here are the tribulation martyrs. These are the people who are going to die in the tribulation. If you look at it in context, it makes sense. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. O oh Lord, surely I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. To thee I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And what? 
Call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may it be in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Now, you know, I don't know about you. Context is very important, as we know. So we've got a Jewish remnant who have been in the tribulation. And at the end of the tribulation, they've called upon the Lord to be saved. Have they been saved? Return unto thy rest, O my soul. Why? For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You've finally called out for his salvation. And again, don't worry, don't worry at all. All. But every man uh, is a liar to the nation of Israel. They are deceived, aren't they, by all those things going on in the world system today. Now, so when you get to Psalm 117, isn't it wonderful that you've got praise the Lord at the end of verse 19? What have you got when you get to Psalm 117? We did it last time. Praise the Lord. How many nations? nations. It's the millennial reign. The tribulation has gone. The Jews have called out. The martyrs have died there. But precious in the sight of God was the death of his people, the death of his saints, so to speak. When it says precious, he doesn't call them saints. Look, this is, you see, but I've been taught it's saints. Have you? Precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints. But he's saying here, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. They're not saints yet. Amen. You understand? And then we come to 117. Praise the Lord, all nations, Lord him, all peoples. Nobody is going to be able to be on the earth without praising the Lord. Hallelujah. That's why we've got to practice. We, we've got to practice praising the Lord. We're, we're in love with him, aren't we, Nathan? Yes. Daniel, we're in love with him. He'll never lie to you. You believe there's a, something out there that's going to make you bigger, stronger. I urge you with your weights there, Daniel. <laughs> He's the strongest one. You see, the strongest man is the one who can give his life for someone else. And Jesus did. Now, we've got to the millennial reign, and we're coming to the 22 letters in a minute. Verse 2, look what, the, look what the Jewish, look what the world will say. For his loving kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. Why is it everlasting? Just quickly, go to Isaiah 9, verse 6, for a moment, please. We know all these. I get a sense of butterflies when I turn to them because I know them, I can pitch them. Alison and I have been blessed with a photographic memory in the midst of all this. <laughs> Haven't we? Haven't we? And um, we're going to Isaiah 9, verse 6 for a moment, please. Yeah. And look, should we start at for 6? Uh, and, and the heading of this chapter is the birth and reign of the Prince of Peace. This is who Israel will have called out for. And it says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. The government, well, that's what you've just seen in Psalm 117. The government is no longer the Antichrists, no longer the Satanic Three, anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-spirit. Two of them have been thrown into the fire. And the other one is being left for a thousand years before he ultimately gets thrown into the pit. But the government is going to rest upon his shoulders after he deals with the nations that are surrounding Israel. The government forevermore will rest upon his shoulders. There'll be no fiddling like the saying that the Tories are infiltrating now the voting of the Labour Party. There'll be no Mr. Corbyn, but there will be a glorious Jesus Christ who will not be a stranger to us here. Because we already know him. And what is even better, he already knows us. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And here we go again. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You see, forevermore. forever. All the kingdoms will have moved. Everything will have changed forever. We're on the earth for a very short time, but the time is coming when Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign. Now, Psalm 118 is the very psalm that the Jews used to read when they celebrated the Passover. 
Now, if we just turn, for those who aren't sure, to Exodus 12 for a moment, the celebration of the Passover is a type of our salvation. And the word pe pesa for Passover means to skip over, to jump over, and to pass over. And we can see here, look, in verse 3 of chapter 12, Exodus 12, verse 3, that it was all about the giving of a lamb. That's what it's all about. We are the lamb's wife. We are the lamb's... My word, this is gorgeous. This is like the two women coming into um, back to Bethlehem at the time of barley harvest, do you remember? It, it says they stirred the city when they came in. Isn't that true? Good to see you, ladies. You've worked so hard. You've worked so hard. Good to see you. Meanwhile, we're back in Exodus. Now, just for you, Nathan, just for you, Daniel, and anyone who isn't absolutely sure, when we say Passover, we mean the death of a lamb. Who is a lamb? Jesus is the lamb of God who does what? He takes away the sin of the world. As you get older, you realize what sin is more and more. And you constantly have to remember that there is a lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world to take away all of our sin. Okay, so verse 3, speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, that means nothing lacking in this lamb, this lamb's blood will be enough. They are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. And we know that, look, this, this dear lamb is to be killed in verse 6. He's to have no blemish in verse 5. Should we read this together, please? Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. The lamb had to die for the world. The lamb died for me. I am the lamb's bride. We are the lamb's bride. But then look at it, it says, verse 7, Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Okay, let's go back to Psalm 118. The Passover lamb, it shows you here, is just about to be bound to the altar. The reason we're looking at Psalm 108 is, uh, 118 is this is called, um, this is the last psalm that celebrates the Passover and it's called the Halal. It's the praise psalm. And this is the psalm that Jesus sang with his disciples on the night of his betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay. Because, no, 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 it's called, no, well, hallelujah, hallelujah. He, so it's H-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E. but yes, that is the irony, isn't it? Uh, you know, uh, it is an irony, isn't it? A way that the enemy can only counterfeit, can't he? But this is called the praise, the halal. That's what the Jewish people call it, the halal. It is called the halal, the praise, and he sang this psalm. Now, we're not going to read it out, but let's just do one, two, together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let who? We've been speaking of Israel. Oh, let Israel say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say, his loving kindness. This is Israel. From my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Look, it's Israel. All nations surrounded me in the name of the Lord. I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. 
That's another wonder for another night. They were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling. This is the nation of Israel. The world is pushing them violently. It looks like they'll fall. But this is why when when we've looked at the news at night, we can open our Bibles and look and say, but the Lord helped me. 14, the Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. Here you go. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Who is the right hand of the Lord? It is the Messiah. It is Yeshua. It is Jesus. Israel is saying his right hand has done valiantly for us. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. He's in heaven now. Hallelujah. No longer on the cross. He's reading this. He's singing this before he goes to Gethsemane. And look, he's prophesying ultimately of the day that you and I have been chosen to live in. And one day Israel are going to sing this song. And it will be there, halal. It will be there. Praise the Lord. Isn't it lovely? Verse 16. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. And again, you see, and we know this, if it's mentioned twice... The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Look what Israel says. I shall not die, but live and tell of the works of the Lord. Oh, but look what he says about the tribulation, folks. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Isn't that wonderful? They will not be given over to death because they're going to, their lives are somehow going to be protected supernaturally. And the three nations of the the middle of Jordan, and uh, three areas, Moab, Ammon, they're going to bring the food to the Jews. But look at this bit here. Well, you see, it can be. Um, it's as... Because um, what... The interesting thing, Sue, is in 19, and I hope you see that, open to me the gates of righteousness, the Jewish people are asking. I shall enter through them. So they have to come through his righteousness. I shall give thanks to the Lord. And then he says something else. Look in verse 20. This is the gate of the Lord. There's only one gate. Jesus said, I am the gate. I am the door. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. Verse 21. And when they've entered through it, they say, I shall give thanks to thee. Why? For thou hast answered me, and thou hast become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And that day is the entering in of that gate of the Israel nation, and they will then enter into his righteousness. So it goes from gates to gate. There's only one gate, and they have to find that out. There is only one gate to enter in. Jesus is the gate, isn't it? And we all know, don't we, about the stone. And if you uh, just want to find out where he, he did say it, if you go to Mark for a moment, please, Mark 14, verse 26. You know, when you've just read, um, we, we were chatting today, myself and the ladies and, and Alec, and um, the everything in the world is corrupt, isn't it? There's corruption everywhere, and obviously there's all mayhem about, you know, what's happening in, in Greece and, and the Macedonians with the tear gas not letting the... Oh, everything is really in, in uproar. But when we've just read that together, you sense that almighty power of God, that what he said shall come to pass. And as you read it, it makes such sense that you go from the one birth to the other birth to the other birth, and you find... You find the answers, the Lord's answer, don't you? So Mark 14, verse 26, it says, And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And remember, the hymn that they sang is Psalm 118. He's about to become the gate of righteousness. He's about to become the stone that fell. And if you just go as well as in two places, the other one is in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30. 26 verse 30. Amen. And here we go. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus is the fulfillment of this psalm and he sings it with Judas? They sing it, don't they? They sing it when they're going to be 
betrayed. And look what he says, verse 13. We'll go to 31, please. And after singing a hymn, they, have I said it, Matthew 26, verse 30? After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, he is the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Mm. And, you know, if you just um, go for a moment to Matthew 21, verse 43, and the other finger, take it to Job for a moment, please. We're going, <laughs> we're going to go to Matthew. Now, you've not been using those fingers for a while, have you, Sue? <laughs> 21, verse 43. Jesus, 21, verse 43. Then I think it was um, Job. Um, and I... Let me have a look. Yeah. And it's Job 38. Yeah. And, you know, when you go to Job, for, when we go, we'll go to Matthew 21, 42 first. 42, 43. Jesus is speaking to the chief priests. Look, if you look in Matthew 21, verse 23, it says, And when he had come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus goes into, chapter, into verse 33, and he speaks of the parable of the landowner. And the landowner, he's actually saying here, that the vineyard was Israel, who had rejected the prophets, and the rightful heir was his son. But this vineyard was now given to someone else, because in Matthew chapter 12, he left the house of his family, and he went and sat by the sea, which is the Gentiles. Now he's saying here that the vineyard, we're in the vineyard now, we've been grafted in to the vine. And so we are in here now. And then as he's speaking in verse 42, Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? Has become, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So Jesus there is saying exactly what they sang in Psalm 118. And if you go to Job 38 for a moment, please, verse 7, verse 6. Do you remember when we looked at this about the cornerstone? We're going to Job 38, verse 7, please. We're going to see Jesus come back, aren't we? 38, verse 7. I love this. You see, Job and his friends have said just about everything, and then the Lord opens his mouth, and everybody else says, Job says, I am vile. I shall put my hand over my mouth. And, you know, there's been times in my life where I think, Best thing you can do, Julie, is shut up in the presence of the Lord, and he's going to show you wonderful things. But when he says here, should we just start at, at verse 1 for a moment and read 1 to 6? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man. Whoa, I will ask you, and you instruct me, knowing that we could not give God the answer. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Now, we did this before, ladies. Verse 6, and when it says, On what were its bases sunk, is the word Eden. But it's actually Adonai. On, so he's speaking about him being the cornerstone. On what were its bases, foundation, on what was Adonai? Is to be, on what was Adonai sunk or who laid its cornerstone? So Adonai and cornerstone in that verse are coming together. Now, we all know that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And we know that at the beginning, the men of Babel, they built with bricks. They did not build with stone. Bricks are what you can make yourself. Stone is the stone and the shepherd of Israel. 
Okay, so if we're just going to turn for a moment, please, to Matthew chapter 24, and then we're going to go to the Matthew 24, and I'm trying to be really quick. Okay, now, I don't know about you, I like to get it into some order. I know the night's gone, the, <laughs> the night's gone. If you um, have a look here in Matthew 24 for a moment... Jesus is speak, and then put your finger in Psalm 118. I want to know what he's singing to you. <laughs> because you see, he's actually said here, hasn't he? Uh, if we go back to 118 and keep your finger in Matthew 24. And when it says here, verse 22, look. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Um, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech thee. O Lord, we beseech thee, do send prosperity. Well, prosperity will only come to the world when Israel gets its proper place in the Messiah. Yeah? And then he says, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us light. Here he is, bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God and I give thanks to thee. Thou art my God, I extol thee. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. Now, when you've got to the end of 118, the Lord here, as Israel have recognized who the sacrifice is, and then when you get to Psalm 119, you've actually got the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet in eight verses for each letter. This is why we've had to do the intro to get there, okay? So to get there, you've got to go through um, 116, Israel calling out, the, the tribulation, the martyred saints, and then the millennium reign is 117. Then they're recalling the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's singing that very song that he sang in Gethsemane. Then you come to a nation, a world that loves the law of the Lord. And it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Well, I want to live where I don't see cattle trucks with sheep. And, you know, I get upset if I see a cattle truck with sheep. But then I get really upset if the sheep aren't in there because then I think, have they been gone and been killed? I don't know about it. Does that happen to anybody? One of the nicest things that happens to you in the morning, you think it's a rabbit on the road and you get there and it's a sock. I don't know about you, that makes me very happy because I think these are innocent victims of the fall. Death is not what God... He doesn't even want us to look upon death. Can you imagine Adam and Eve in the garden and then the creature comes in and they have to maybe cut its throat and they watch lifeblood fall from that creature so that they can be clothed. Death, we're not meant to be looking on death. And you know, with social media, we see so many beheadings and we see all these terrible things and these aborted babies that are alive and they're taking their brains and their hearts out and... I said to Sarah on Sunday night, I'm, I'm finding it overwhelming and I have to try and move past some. Um, the earth cannot carry on. It cannot carry on. And as Jacob has told us, you know, the obstetricians and the doctors that are trying to save babies' lives are in wards right next to where people are having multiple abortions. And... and you know, to have that baby that they opened the front of his brain and took his, opened the front of his head and took his brain out as an aborted fetus. And these are so shocking, aren't they? And we're leaving. We're leaving. We're going to leave this world. We're going to leave because, you see, there are secrets in dark places, but there's nothing that the Lord doesn't see. And today, we're just looking Jesus it went to the Mount of Olives. He sang a song with his disciples that talked about the sacrifice being bound to the altar. He talked about the stone returning. He talked about blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and saying that Israel on that day, he says, you won't see me again until I hear you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
So when we've gone to Psalm 119 uh, here, we've now, if you turn your page over in where it says meditations and prayers relating to the law of God. Now, going back to 116, if you turn back with me, please, have, that is Israel, the remnant, calling out for help. Yes? Yep. Do you mind if we do do it this way so we know that in that the, uh, psalm, the tribulation was there, the calling out was there, the death of the tribulation martyrs were there, then you've got the millennium, but only after the Lord heard their cry. Then you get to Psalm 118, and what's it called? Thanksgiving for the Lord's saving goodness. They've been saved, and they're looking back, and they say how good it was to take refuge in him. And we knew in that verse, verse 2, oh, let Israel say, so do you understand that the Psalms are speaking of a prophetic day for the Messiah to make contact with Israel in answer to their prayer as they're suffering in the tribulation? So then we turn the page up, we've got the Hallelujah Psalm, and then we've got meditations, it says, Psalm 119, and prayers relating to the law of the Lord. Well, the law of God, is, it says the knowledge of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And that's in the order it's going to come in. Now, the number 22, as we know, is a very important number. Now, I wanted to just, um, all this is, is down here. Jesus Christ is the true cornerstone. Where in our Bibles does it say, Jesus, the cornerstone, has to come down as a smiting stone? He's speaking about it in, yes, I'd love a dad like him. He so wants you to know the Lord. Amen. Yes, it's Daniel chapter 2. Let's turn to it for a moment, please. You see, Jesus keeps referring to himself as the true stone. But you see, here, um, the cornerstone has got a crush, and Israel has been crushed. In the millennium, it will be, in the, sorry, tribulation, it will be crushed even more. But he's going to come, and he's going to crush the nations that are trying to crush him. Daniel chapter 2, verse 34, okay? You continued looking until a stone, stone was cut out without hands. So it's Jesus coming on the second coming. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay, crushed them. Now, let's go down to the last sentence of verse 35. This is called the fifth kingdom because you've got the four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But when you get to the last sentence, but the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And that's why the law of the Lord is going out because the stone has come and he says, you, the, the stone, he's singing it uh, in, in the night of Gethsemane, he's singing about the day the stone will come and crush the Gentile power because the vineyard has been handed over to the Gentiles. But on there's coming a day where the Gentiles' day has finished, the end of the Gentiles will come and, the, and the, all the emphasis goes back to the Jewish people. Now, <laughs> well, you know, this is a hugely debatable, are we pre-rapture, mid-rapture? All we know is um, I grew up pre-tribulation. I've been saved from the wrath that is to come, and I believe that to be very much a possibility. Amen. At the end of the day, none of us know. It would be foolish to say we know, wouldn't it? Didn't he just say, you answer me? God says, Job, you answer me. Uh, would I be foolish enough to say I know when the truth... Pardon? But we do know that we have a keeping saviour. And we must stand faithful to the nation of Israel. Now, this would be the problem with the people. They'll think we're being political. We're not. There's nothing political here, is there, in that sense? It's truth. There's going to come the stone from heaven as the great smiting stone. And he doesn't stop there. He says, and this stone, it's going to fill the whole, it's come a mountain. Well, he says, I've already installed my son on Zion's holy hill. And all the nations are going to keep making their way up to my mountain. So we can look ahead, look ahead, look ahead. Ooh, we keep looking ahead. We just keep looking ahead because there's only one who's going to come and rule and reign. And he's going to put the end to the Gentile power. You see, when Jesus is speaking about all this, um, I, I look, 
Go back for a moment to Matthew 24, please. People get confused and think this is the church. This is Jewish ground, okay? Are you all right, Alison? Yeah. Feeling hot? Yeah. We're all hot. Matthew 24. I want to just show you something here. When it says here, we are looking for that phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's found in Matthew 23, verse... Let's start at 37 and go to 39. Jesus speaking, lament over Jerusalem. We're going to read this together, okay? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you from now on, you shall not see me, Israel, until you say... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, you can write there, 24, sign of Christ's return. This is entirely Jewish ground. This is not speaking of the church now. This is speaking of the Jewish people. He's just turned and he says, you're not going to see me again. Now, where had he said that before? He would said it in the psalm that he sang with them in the Mount of Olives, Psalm 118. He then he turns and he says, that psalm I'm singing to you, you're not going to even say that again till you see me come. There's no other sign given to Israel in that way. Now, we've done this before, but very quickly. He goes down, and in here, we have got the four horses of the apocalypse coming out. Okay, Matthew 24, here, if you see it in verse 5, okay, Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, and will mislead many. Remember what we said, that is the white, ha white horse of false peace. Who's riding on the white horse of false peace? The Antichrist. Well done. Then when you get down to the result of the false peace, which will have to be reneged upon halfway through the tribulation, so are we pre-tribulations or mid-tribulationists? You see, you get to verse 6, and you will be hearing of war, which is the red horse, and rumours of wars. But see that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. The red horse takes away the false peace. So you've got a false peace followed by war. And then now you've then got to try, then the next horse is coming quickly. Verse 7, look at nation will rise against nation. Right, but ultimately they will want to uh, defeat Israel. Kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. A famine is a result of the false peace, which was a lie, and the war then everybody in the war goes hungry. Now, but this one is really interesting. Then he says, here's the green horse, verse 9. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. Why is that the green horse? Because it's the horse of tribulation. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. That is the the, a rider on a horse of death and Hades. But if you go for one moment to Ezekiel 14, verse 21, what did we say the stone has to come down and do? Oh, well done. The stone has to come down and strike the Gentile nations. Okay, go to 1421. And what? Because I'm writing this book to go to Greece, so all of us could just take one book I was thinking, which was easier. But have a look here. Is it, look what this prophet said, Ezekiel 14, 21. For thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem, sword, famine, wild beasts. Well, well who were the beasts? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. 
right to the very end. That's why he has to come at the end of the revised Roman Empire, okay? Because here, Ezekiel is prophesying, and he says here, my four severe judgments are what the Gentile nations are going to be ultimately in charge of the harassment of the Jews at the end of the age. Now it says, to cut off man and beast from it. Look at, look at verse 20. Even though Noah who was saved by the ark, Daniel, who was saved by the lions, saved from the lions, and Job, who actually was in the midst of Leviathan, which is the sea monster, which is the beast that comes out of the sea, but he's also saved in a way from the behemoth, which is the beast that comes from the earth. So you've got your religious and your political beasts at the end of the age. Even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord God, they could, this day is going to be so terrible, they could not deliver either their son or their daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. Terrible days are coming. But he's, Jesus is saying to us now, we're to have no fear. And to the Jewish people, the only hope is that they take the way out that God has given to them. Now, I want you to turn, in a moment, I want you to go to Lamentation, please. Lamentation. The subject of the Lord is so... Now, is anybody confused with what I've said? No. Okay, I just want to tell you something. Um, I can hear myself say that. Do you know what an acrostic is? Yeah. An acrostic... Now, Sue will like this. She'll go, what's that? Um, Psalm 119 is an acrostic. It's got 22 Hebrew letters with eight verses in each. Why? Because it's new beginnings for who? For Israel. We've got our new beginning when I give my life to Jesus. You're already in your new beginning. Yeah. But you, so Israel have got their new beginning. The whole nations of the earth have got a new beginning because the Gentiles are going to be blessed by the Jews. So then God has a psalm written down with the whole 22 letters in it. I'm going to explain the reason why in a minute. But they haven't got one um, verse to each letter. He's chosen to do eight. New beginnings, new beginnings, new beginnings. For the world's going to know what it's like to live under God for the very first time, which is a wonderful thing, isn't it? So, well, when you get to Lamentation, You've got five chapters, and we did this last time, okay? You've got chapter one is how many? If you turn the page over, 22. You've got chapter two, which is 22. You've got chapter three, which is 66. I'm going to explain why in a moment. Then you get to chapter four, 22. Chapter 5, 22. Now, if you know very much about the book of Lamentation, do you know what the Jewish people call, if you go to the beginning of the book of Lamentation, the Jewish people refer to this book as how. How. Yeah, ekar. Yeah, because if you go, it's speaking of the sorrows of Zion. And the Jewish people just call it this, how. Look, if you, what's the first verse? The first word says, how? And that's all the Jewish people call it, how. But they call it by the Hebrew name, meaning how, which is E-K-H-A-H. -H. Rabbis call this little book, how? And the book is called The Sorrow of Zion. How? But it means something else in the Hebrew. It means, alas, alas. Lonely sits the city that was full of... We're in Lamentation 1, verse 1. How? Isn't that amazing? You know, how? Alas, or it means in the Hebrew, how sad it is. So we could read it like this. How sad it is that the... How sad it is that lonely sits the city that has that was full of people. She has become like a widow who was once great amongst the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a forced laborer. Yeah, okay. So we've got 
Chapter 1 is an acrostic. Chapter 2 is an acrostic. Chapter 3 is an acrostic. Chapter 4 is an acrostic. Chapter 5 isn't. But it's got 22 letters in it. Well, this is wonderful when you start to look because, uh, you know, this is God's order. Now, people will say there aren't chapters and verses. No, there aren't. But this is still in the content of God's living word, isn't it? Now, when you go to chapter 3, it's, it's, it's the chapter that speaks of hope more than anything else. And it's actually speaking here. Look what it says in uh, verse 19. Hope of relief in God's mercy. Look what it says in verse 17. My soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. This is the Jewish people. Look what it says in verse 10. He is to me like a bear. A vicious beast lying in wait. Like a lion in secret places. Look at verse 7. He has worn me in so that I cannot go out. And you turn the page over. And when it says, look at verse 46 for the Jewish people. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Panic and pitfall, this is the tribulation, have befallen us. Devastation and destruction. My eyes run down with streams of water because of the destruction of the daughter of the people. But the good news is this, 64 to 66. No, look, go to 55 first. I called on thy name, O Lord, out of the lowest pit. It's the Jews in the tribulation who will finally call out to the Lord. And then they say this, 56, thou hast heard my voice. Do not hide thine ear from my prayer for relief for my cry for help. And then he goes on, 64. Thou wilt recompense them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. Thou wilt give them hardness of heart. The curse will be on them. Thou wilt pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. They suffer at the end, but they're going to be delivered. Now, just look in verse 8 of chapter 4. Their appearance, this is Israel, is what? Blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the street. Their skin is shriveled on their bones. It is withered. It has become like wood. So, yes, about... <laughs> but it's marvelous. But isn't it amazing that, um, you know, I was thinking of 66... Um, 66... Uh, the 66 pieces on the candlestick. And we did the study, do you remember? And God has chosen to put three sets of the Hebrew alphabet in the very chapter that speaks of the midst of Jerusalem suffering. But it's there crying out for help, hope, and mercy. And he stayed longer on that subject than he has in the other chapters. But did you know this? Jose the original Bible, Josephus says, has only 22 books. Do you want to go through and do it? If you go to your, if you go to your um, thing at the front here, the early church fathers, you know, the contents, and just see how they did it, 22. An acrostic is not a hidden code. Yeah. Number 22, Sue, is a vital number. We said it's the generations from Adam to the nation of Israel. The, jo the Jewish historian Josephus stated the Hebrew Bible had 22 books. Several of the church fathers speak of the 22 books of the Bible. Why were they written in, in poems? To help us to remember them. So what they're trying to remind us is if we're going to learn what this alphabet is, we're going to know what to look for in each one of the verses, which is what we're doing again tomorrow with the ladies. But this is interesting, isn't it? You've got five books of the law, five. Joshua is one book, six. Judges and Ruth go together, that's seven. One Samuel and two Samuel go together, which is eight. One Kings and two Kings go together, which is nine. 
One and two chronicles go together, which is 10. Ezra and Nehemiah go together, which is 11. Then you've got Esther, 12, Job 13, Psalms 14, Proverbs 15, Ecclesiastes 16, Song of Solomon 17, Isaiah 18, Jeremiah and Lamentations 19, Ezekiel 20, Daniel 21. I've done it wrong again, but I've done it a fact. Daniel, that's right, and then the Daniel is 21, and then these 12 prophets, minor prophets from Hosea to Malachi are one, yes. And that's how they get their 22 books of the Bible. Now, what I think is amazing, um, I've written all this down for you, by the way, um, on the notes, is if the candlestick, the manifestation of the light, it's got 66 what they term as pieces are on it, which all speak about, um, remember the thigh is what Joseph, Jacob, rest, the Lord wrestled with Joseph, in the night, in the thigh, before the light came at the end. Should we just go there for a moment? Do you find a picture forming that is so marvellous and so wonderful that you begin to think, as Yaakov said, he read the Bible so he could discount it, he ended up having to... It would have took more faith not to believe in it. And tonight, are you seeing... I'm not doing this very well, but an order coming in this wonderful word of God. We've gone from 1-1, one, one, can anyone remember? 1-1-6, one, one, the remnant calling out, to 1-1-7, one, one, after they've called out, there's a millennial reign, to 1-1-8, one, one, they're recounting the glory of the Lord, and 1-1-9, one, one, do you know what? Yeah, an acrostic um, word, and I wrote this down. It, before you write this down, folks, acrostic comes from two words. Across meaning extremity. Extremity. Across, extremity, meaning the beginning to the end. Well, what I think is wonderful then, that's the start of it. He's saying the whole entirety of the whole life of mankind, the plan of redemption, the providence of God, was to get us all under his government under his mountain forevermore and to learn how to really live. Well, I don't know about you. I think that's marvellous. It takes us a long way to get there, doesn't it? But we've stuck with us. So we've got across spelled A-K-R-O-S, if you're a student. Extremity, meaning the beginning to the end. And stickos, meaning a row. So you've got an across stick. Across stickos meaning extremity beginning to the end in a row. He's a God of perfect order, isn't he? Now, when Alec came up, uh, was it late last night, uh, and I, I said, oh, I don't know how many thousands of words I was on, because there's thousands of it, and I said, I haven't quite got to finish the 22nd letter off. He said, Julie, you probably won't even get to letter one again tonight by the time you've gone through it, and that is the truth. But you... I wanted to kind of give you the background how the Lord showed me, because you can understand why he's revealing, why in lament lamentation he's showing the biggest emphasis on 66 is there's re more relief in that chapter than in the others. And the Jewish people are calling that book, alas, how sad it is. And that's going to finish. And then I thought, well... If it means extremity in a row, God has laid down for us, verse by verse, word by word in the Bible, that our very end, isn't that true? Uh, our beginning to end. We're part of it, an enormous part of it. He sent his son to bring us in. And the more you see it, I was saying to these ladies today, I can watch the news because I've got Jesus. I can understand what's going on politically because I've got Christ. Because I, I'm given wisdom in the night. Counsel and wisdom are mine, says the Lord. I want to teach you. And that's what he's trying to show us tonight. And the enemy is trying to put every distraction before us so that we can't do it. But you see, if you go to Genesis 32 for a moment, please, and put your finger in Exodus. Now, you knew you wouldn't get away with it, didn't you? Only having one finger. Go to Exodus 26 as well, please. Can 
can I just show you this? And, and may, maybe, yes, we have got to go. You know, oh, I get just all too wonderful for words because I, what do you think? You see, think, um, oh, all hail the Lamb, Amen. enthroned on high. Amen. He's revealing this to his children, us. But if you look in Genesis 32, you've got Jacob wrestling. But can you see in Genesis 32, 22, how Jacob, and remembering, Jacob is now about to wrestle with the Lord. A type of tribulation. But look at verse 22. Think of Jesus going into the garden and wrestling in death. Now he arose that same night, took his two wives, his two maids, and how many children? Eleven. The same as the disintegration of the disciples when Judas betrayed him. There's going to be a man in the garden with the eleven who's going to have um, a contact with God. You see, Jacob sends them across. Isn't that amazing? I put here 11 children, just as Jesus had 11 disciples. Remember, the 22 generations go from Adam to Jacob. Jacob's thing here is he's got to wrestle. And Jacob is Israel that's got to wrestle with the Lord. He took them, 23, and sent them across the stream. And he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob, think of it, as Israel, was left alone. We just looked how many nations are going to want to destroy. It says the beasts are coming. The horses are coming. The false peace is coming. The false Messiah has arrived. Then that is exposed and then there's a war. Then there's a famine. Then there's a deadly pestilence. But it's only for, at that time, the nation of Israel. Jacob was left alone in a man, hallelujah, Wrestled, it means grappled with him. Grappled. Is Jesus going to grapple with Israel? Have we just read the description of them tonight? They're going to be black. The sinners scorch me, do not look at me, the Song of Solomon says. But when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said... Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. Who's coming at the dawn? The Messiah. His day is coming. But he said, Jacob says, I will not let you go. That's Israel at the end. I won't let you go unless you bless me. So he turns and he says, what is your name, this man with the 11 disciples? Think about it. And he says, well, Jesus was Israel, wasn't he, in a way? Jesus was the king of the Jews. And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob. Your name, oh, but Israel, for you have striven with God. Israel will strive with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, then he said, asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you asked my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. When you look up in verse 25, the word for thigh, 3409, have we done it before? You go to the golden lampstand in Exodus 25. Verse 31, you've got a hammered golden lampstand. Was Jesus hammered in the garden? Was he hammered on the cross? Is he, is he the king of Israel? Is he the king of the Jews? Is he, is he going to be bringing the end? And this golden lampstand has 66 pieces of... Don't worry. It, what difference does it make, sweetie? It makes no difference. We're all saved. We're all family. We're all on our way home. And one day Luke and I are going to walk around them streets together. Hey, you see, this is what we are to be, family of God. Do you know, Luke was my accompaniment in my message for an hour before I got here tonight. Luke was all the way through my message. I think it's absolutely wonderful that your son is here and God's son is here. 
And we've got to come out of the natural thinking. And we've got to get into the supernatural thinking. And we've got to stay here. We've been chosen by God to understand these things. And we haven't got to understand them to the point of sweating like Jesus sweat for us. But we're receiving them tonight. And the words have got life of their own. His word lives in us. He is inside of us. He lives in us. He is the right hand of God, exalted on high, and our spirit is already with him. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters but Jesus, does it? And here he is. He's the golden lampstand in verse 31. Then you shall make a lampstand of what sort of gold? He's going to come and light up the earth after Jacob's night of trouble. Then you shall make a lampstand of pure gold, the lampstand and its base and its shaft. Three, four, oh, nine is exactly the same as Genesis 32. Jacob's thigh. Do you see that? Go back to 32, 25. We're finishing here. He touched the socket of his thigh. Three, four, oh, nine. So then later on, you get a golden lampstand with 66 pieces of furniture on it. And the woe and the how of the sorrow and distress of Zion as, 60, as an acrostic, not just the beginning in a row, three beginnings, three sets of 22. Well, I think that's divine. I think, this is what I think, right, because I, I'm just silly. I think one that explains the Father, one that explains the Son, one that took the whole alphabet to explain the triunity working with the nation of Israel. How does it stop? Why are the 66 pieces of furniture on the lampstand bearing a shaft is the same as a man's thigh? This man's thigh. It's, it's Christ, isn't it here? The lampstand, its base and its shaft are to be made of what sort of work? Hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, its flowers shall be of one piece with it. You see, go back. Just to finish, Genesis 32. Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. We're just about to break in. <laughs> you see, the reason Israel's passed from death to life, and that is why he begins then with the ox head. Now, very quickly, the ox head, the Aleph, is the ox, the strength, the leader is also the dreamer. Who is called the dreamer in the Bible? Joseph, who is a type of Christ. So, oh, it's just wonderful. Should we just finish here. It's so lovely. We've got 11 children across the ford. And then you've got a man wrestling with Jacob. So Christ is going to wrestle with the Jewish people. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. It all came from the bruising and the wounding of his own son. In that garden that night, he sweat drops of blood. He sang a song that said, you won't see me again until you say, Baruch Kabar Hashem Adonai. Job said, he's the socket and the foundation of the cornerstone. And so somewhere in this wonderful mystery of the 22 letters, there is a love story, but it settles in the book of Lamentation. Um, Psalm 145 is an acrostic, there are others, but I think that's marvelous. The woe of Zion is in those five sets. So what we're going to do, if that's okay, we'll start at number one, on Sunday morning in, in this um, section, okay? And, um, but, uh, but Father, thank you for tonight. And um, thank you so much. Oh, Father, there isn't, there isn't a poet, there isn't an artist, there isn't a musician, there isn't a scientist, there isn't anyone, Lord, that's had human training or, or a gift that can cause our hearts to flutter like you do 
when we open your precious word. And tonight we think of the nation of Israel and we pray for its prosperity, its preservation, its peace tonight. And we know when we're praying this prayer that they're going to have to go through this procedure that you have ordained in your word. But Lord, we just thank you in the midst of it. Lord, there'll be a way of escape. And we pray even tonight that before the Jews have to go in to that place that's been prepared for them, we pray that the scales would fall from the eyes of the people, not just Jews, but Gentiles, Arabs, Muslims, or oh, Father. Our lives would be so empty without the love of your precious Son. We would have no wisdom, Lord, if it was left of this world, but we've been given wisdom today. And may you watch over this wisdom in our hearts, we pray. Whatever's the flesh, yes, Lord, we want it to go. And we just want your word, Father, to touch our hearts. We pray for those who are having to travel. And thank you for family. And I, yes. I, I love them, Lord. And, and you love them. And we love each other. And may the love of Jesus Christ keep our hearts together, we pray. In Jesus' name.